on that. Double check one more thing. Yeah, the um, the school with the with the kids they they have destroyed my ability to keep my podcasting rig because we only have so many places for the kids to do their stuff, and mm -hmm. and mine has been transcripted or con conscripted. I think that's yeah. <laughs> that not not transcripted. Transcripted would be if they wrote it out for you. <laughs> yeah, no, they're not. No, there's no none of that. Um, all right, bear with me here. Take your time. Uh, recording this. And then what time zone are you in? New York, Eastern Standard. Oh, we're on the same time zone. Okay. Or daylight Perfect. savings, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, here we go. Um, Dotto, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. All right. Perfect. All right. Bob Dotto, welcome to the show. Thank you to Mike for putting us in contact with each other. Mike's a great guy. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed reading your book. And um, and I'm, I'm I'm thankful for your patience with me being tardy to our to our schedule time tonight. <laughs> Not so, a problem. Um, but yeah, man, I'm glad to have you on. And welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Yeah. So, um, who who are, who is Bob? Like, if you're like, yeah, all right. So we've got a minute and take as mm -hmm. many minutes as you need. Like, who, what, why are Bob? And that's a broken sentence on purpose. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's a, uh, like most people, there's probably a, a, a seemingly infinite number of facets to that. But, but I mean, really, you know, I, as far as the work and the book is concerned, you know, I'm, I'm someone who's been interested in spiritual things since, a, since I was a teenager um, and uh, just kind of followed that, those threads wherever they led me. So they led me to a whole bunch of places. Um, through my teens and twenties and thirties, and now I'm 42. So, um, and all I went far and beyond what my sort of cultural upbringing, which was, I guess, Roman Catholic, essentially, um, though we were not, I wouldn't say practicing, we were more like cultural, I always mm -hmm. called us cultural Catholics. Um, but, you know, I went and, and explored all sorts of religious and spiritual traditions and practices and communities and stuff. And then, you know, the past 10 years was really starting to reinvestigate that kind of like root, root religion, you know? Um, so that's what I've been doing mostly, but there's so many, <laughs> there's so yeah. many other parts to talk about. <laughs> what, do mean, what do you mean root religion? Root religion being Catholicism or root religion being something else? Root religion. Uh, so I use the term root religion for the, the religion that people were born into. Um, so not root religion in any sort of historical sense. I just mean like a person's personal root religion. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of people that are culturally religious um, mm -hmm. and have, yeah, I've come to realize that um, religious uh, literacy, regardless of the religion, seems to be relatively low. I used to think it was just a Christian thing where people, you know, really studied and, and dug into their faith. And I'm coming to find that that's just not true. A lot of religions are that way. Like you're, you're, you were born this or born that. And so that's what you are. And when you start pressing into the, the to the harder topics, the questions and answers just seem really, really, really shallow, which is really discouraging, I think. Yeah, you know, I, I think religion, you know, I see religion as culture, you know, I, I see it as a fundamental aspect of culture. And in some ways, it is culture. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, people kind of per perform their culture um, and their religion in, in the ways that they do, you know, whether they know the the nuances and the philosophies and the history and the myriad of voices that speak for that tradition, that, that seems to definitely be low, <laughs> you know, Yeah. but it's not everyone's thing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So your book sitting with spirits. Um, and I think I got that name, right. I, I have the digital copy, so I've had to memorize the name. That is the name, right? Sitting with spirits, sitting with spirits, exploring the margins of, um, the unseen margins of Christianity. Yeah. So I saw the book title. I was like, I don't know what's happening here. I read mm -hmm. the first chapter. I was like, ah. so my, my upbringing, my cultural <laughs> root had nothing to do. Like we talked about the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that one week, it, just uh -huh. that one week. The rest of the time, we're just talking about Jesus. Like we're not talking about it any other time. Mm -hmm. um, so the whole con, like I'm, um, 
very anxious for the conversation because we are well outside of both my comfort zone and my knowledge, if that makes any sense, because I still like to dive in to head things. Do you find that common as you talk about not spirituality necessarily, but spirits with people? Um, I mean, yes and no. It really depends what circles I'm in. You know, I'm I, the the circles that I tend to to hang out in are pretty friendly to those kinds of ideas and 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 practices and experiences. Um, so, in in that sense, I don't really bump up against much. When I get into more, um, and these are of course people who've explored. Uh, multiple religious traditions typically. So they, mm-hmm. they sort of like been around other ones that might've had a, more of an affinity to that kind of subject matter. So they're a little more maybe used to it, but you know uh, I've certainly noticed with this book that when it's in the hands of Christians, people who have been raised Christian and kind of like maintained that thread throughout their life um, that it, it can be a little bit tricky, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. Which is fun, you know, which is great. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. happy to talk. About Why do you that. think that is? Because I can't put my finger on it outside of like, I don't know. Like I asked a friend that is um like Pentecostal and way more charismatic than me. And he's like, oh yeah, man. Oh, and he just kept talking. I was like, it's a different language. Like it's, it's yeah. so like, why, why, why do you think that is? Well, I mean, I think first off, it's it's a time issue, like a historical issue. Like the the idea of spirits is not really um, in in like favor right now. You know what I mean? Or it has been in the past hundred years. Um, but you know, when we get back into the eighteen hundreds and and stuff like that, that these become the idea of spirits becomes much more a fluid conversation. You know, there's much more of a belief in that these things might be you know real. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas today, it's it's not really appreciated at that level. So there's that. And, and certainly, certainly within Christianity as a whole, different threads of it have emphasized different aspects of, of the teachings. Some, Mm -hmm. you know, like you said, some, it's just Jesus centric, some it's old Testament stuff, you know, some of it's um, charismatic. So the Holy spirit, you know, and then you've got like spiritualism and all, you know, it, I think it really just depends like what the flavor of your community was and where their emphasis was. Yeah. Um, so in your first chapter, um, you use the word rosary, but I've only ever used that word as like the beads, like, right. Correct. Like the rosary beads, but you seem to be using the word rosary in a way that are implying that the whole, and, and just for context, for those that haven't read the book and you should stop doing what you're doing and, and get, to, because it really is a challenging book, at least for me. Um, you, you're talking about being at, I get, would you call it a seance? I, I guess. I don't know what you would call that. Maybe. I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but you're using the word rosary and it seems to be a different thing other than like the beads. So what, what are you doing there? Right. So that might be just kind of a scene thing, you know, rosary, a, a rosary is the beads, but to mm-hmm. say a rosary is, um, I'm guessing you weren't, you're not Catholic, don't no, have, I was okay. raised Protestant. Yeah. Okay. Raised so there, Baptist, yeah. that's the difference. I mean, in, in Catholicism to say a rosary is to, is to use the rosary beads to say the prayers. Mm. Um, and that is typically done in the Marian tra- tradition or practice, you know, where it's, it's a rosary to Mary, but there are things called chaplets, which are variations of a rosary. So mm. a rosary is a certain number of beads and there's certain prayers that are prescribed for it. Um, and, petitions and things like that. So that's, you know, doing a rosary in that respect. So it can be a rosary is both the beads oh, and it's also see. the act. The yeah. Act, so yeah. It, my ignorance is, it's, oh. is bleeding through <laughs> yeah, where I grew up in, in, in Southwest Texas. I'm not even sure where the Catholic church was. Like, yeah. It's just like Bible belt. hundred um, percent. I mean, I grew up in New Jersey. So like it's all we Catholic didn't, church. we didn't know, like as a kid, Christians weren't even like, we weren't Christian. We were Catholic, like Christian was some (laughs) other thing. You know what I mean? I knew it had something to do with something related to what we were, but uh, I I didn't even know, like, I really just had no idea. (laughs) We were like just Catholic. That, that was the thing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm coming to find that that term Christian means way more things than (laughs) either of us was told. (laughs) So, so, when you say the word spirit and it's woven through the whole book, 
Yeah. I think that you're using that word differently than my upbringing would use. So, um, and I actually wrote down, I write down very few questions. Um, and, and, and we may want to come back to this, but like I literally wrote, what's the difference between my sense of self and a sense of spirit? Like, if you, like, cause you're talking about giving spirit voice throughout the book. And then even just in that opening chapter, like as I'm reading things, I was like, what the flip is happening here? Like, sure. how I don't, you know, what is spirit? Like, can we just start there maybe at a foundation? Like, what are we saying when we say that? Cause sure. So that, that changes with different communities. I'll just start that out. But, but my understanding and the way I've experienced it and the way I talk about it is that there's spirit within a person that God bestowed spirit into humanity, into humans. And that's the sort of motivating force. It, it, we see it in our language, you know, they have a really great spirit or very vibrant spirit, or they have a, their spirits very sad, or my, my spirit feels low today or whatever, you know, in the colloquial speech, you can kind of hear sort of uh, the flavor of what a spirit might be. So the spirit is that kind of like the energy you feel during any particular time of the day. Um, when you start looking at spirit as an entity, then then you start seeing it as, yes, it's this sort of motivating kind of feelings kind of thing inside you, but it also remains after you die. In some, some traditions, they believe that, right? That it's like in an untimely death, a case of an untimely death, so-called, uh, the spirit might linger, you know? And you we come across this in ideas of purgatory and, and things mm -hmm. like that as well. Um, so a spirit in the very like basic, sense is like the uh, lingering aspect of a human being in the world, right? Not everyone believes in that. Not everyone ascribes to that definition, um, but that's kind of like a really general. Then of course, there's the Holy Spirit, which is uh, obviously part of the Trinity. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I can, I can take us through the whole yeah. theology no, behind no, all this stuff. No, but, I yeah. think we'll, I think we'll get there. I, no, <laughs> I guess, yeah, no, we'll definitely get there. So, um, what spirit is happening in the community that you're in, in chapter one, because like people are saying things, it feels like at random and you reference kind of like an internal monologue of, I should say this, I should say this. And then you end up not saying anything. Right. Like what is that? Is that someone from their community? Is that just some random spirit in this context just happens to be passing through this community? Like I'm just traveling on the jet stream today. And I'm usually, I'm probably badly using the, the term terminology for spirit there. Like that works. What is that? Okay. So in that community, that's, that's a Lakumi tradition. Um, it's an Afro-Caribbean tradition, um, a spirituality, spiritual system that's been around for, for quite some time. And they have a very robust appreciation of spirit and spirits. Um, so I was at what's called an espiritismo or a, a spiritual misa, um, which is a mass, but not like a mass like you or I have ever been to as right. kids or adults. <laughs> um, right. And so in that world, there are many spirits. Spirits are very much present in the world. The spirits, the lingering spirits of people who have passed. So in that room, people who are sensitive to that kind of stuff uh, will feel as if they are being spoken to or they're getting information or... Um, they're having some sort of experience that feels outside of themselves. And there's different ways of understanding, is that true? And there's, excuse me, a lot of like testing that goes on. So it's not just like everything someone says is, oh, that must be a spirit. You know, sometimes they're like, is it, is it not? And they go through different various ways of determining that. So in that first chapter, I'm in that group and um, I'm watching people perform what is believed to be spirit communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what would the, the average observer, if, mm -hmm. say from, let's just pick a random set, Kansas, if they're okay. in the room with you, like, mm -hmm. what do you think most people would view watching that as an outsider? Demonic, oh. 100%. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> it isn't, it is not, but I, but you know, because there's a lot of cultural baggage that people bring to these mm -hmm. sort of things and that goes both ways, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. y you know, they would probably say that it's, uh, 
you know, this isn't God, this isn't holy. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I shouldn't project because the people who have a, who have familiarity with being overtaken with the Holy Spirit, that very charismatic tradition, they may look at it and be like, I don't know, it looks like Holy Spirit to me. I mean, I've been to some Pentecostal <laughs> churches and I've seen more talking in tongues there than I do here. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, so in one sense, I say, you know, the cultural aspect of it, because there's probably statues around and incense and things that look kind of nefarious, even though they're not, it might be translated as malit, like not of God, but really it is, it's quite godly. In yeah. Yeah. Theme. I want to, I want to, to use a, since we were talking about Texas earlier, let's, let, I'll just do a drilling metaphor because why not? Um, so mm-hmm. I want to drill there on demonic. So part, I think it's chapter four, maybe chapter five. Chapter you're doing four. like, you're talking about like, casting out demons and demonic thought and demonization of the spirit. And that that's kind of a, who, what is it? It's a, a, the, I'm trying to think of the name of the saint. It's a saint. I can't think of the name. It starts with a C. Um, I can't even name. Um, you talk about, here's what you said. So you say there has always been a problem of using Jesus as casting out of demons as a theological justification for demonization of spirits paraphrase there at the end of mine is of spirits so and you use the word most people you know say from kansas would look at that and be like what the hell is happening here like this has to be demonic so how have we how are the two conflated like demonic spirits versus not so historically what what kind of happened is just prior to the biblical era that we see in the bible and certainly Jesus more, more particularly, there was an understanding of spirits, spirits float around, they, they cause mischief. Um, and certainly in Greece and, and, um, well, Greece in particular, there was an understanding that spirit lingered and could be both beneficial and, you know, malicious, you know, um, it was kind of like neutral in that way. Um, as you get, and in the old Testament, you see a bit of this as well, as you get to the time of Jesus, The only spirits that are really mentioned are ones that are essentially causing problems. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they'll talk about like Jesus needed to cast out this, this bad spirit or evil spirit or unclean spirit. Um, They don't talk too much about the spirits that were not causing problems because what's to talk about really. Um, So the, the, as, as the tradition grew, the Christian tradition grew and, and found its way into other cultures, the idea of a demon kind of took over. It just became the governing, the, the, uh, the sort of the default term for what would actually be not so singular, yeah. right? So it just became demons. If someone's, you know, upset, it's demons. If someone's ranting, it's demons you know, all negative, all negative. Mm -hmm. Um, So in that chapter, I think it's chapter four, uh, I'm sort of unpacking that it was a lot more nuanced in in the Bible and certainly in Jesus's work and time. Yeah, yeah. Um, What you'll find with me uh, um, is is I I bounce around quite a bit. Um, Go for it. So, um, yeah, (laughs) so... Or I struggle. This is so the bit, the hardest part for conversations like this are mm. I literally have so little background to fall on <laughs> because of my upbringing. Um, yeah, as I read your book, I kept taking notes and then kept getting frustrated and then kept taking notes and then it, it, it's fine. So it, back, I want to go back to something you said at the very beginning of the book. So you say that you're trying. I think you say some of the effect of you for a while you fell away from the Catholicism of your youth and that you were hoping to find a new Catholicism of the spirit, mm-hmm. um, like a way to, to marry the two. What do you mean when you say Catholicism of the spirit? And, and honestly, have you, have you found a way? Cause I don't know that you really answer that question in the end outside of some appendices, but maybe I feel like it's left open. I could have missed it though. Totally could have missed it. No, I mean, the book itself is kind of a testament to me kind of really embracing it. And I've certainly embraced that tradition um, in a much more broad, more informed fashion than when I was a kid. Um, so that's that's the case now. Um, 
but you know, the book is also written for a lot of the people that I'm in, I'm around, um, and in communication with and talking to and, and all that kind of stuff are people who were like me, you know, had this faith or this religion that they grew into, grew up in, rejected it for any number of reasons. Um, and then over, and we're talking 20 years later, they're starting to be like, wait a minute, you know, there's, there's stuff here. There's stuff here. That's, that's mine. You know what I mean? I grew up in this. I, I could be exploring this. Um, and so people are coming back to it and, you know, I'm kind of speaking to those people and saying, look, this, this tradition is not, everyone's going to tell you it's one thing. Um, it's not one thing. And it's not even a hundred things. It's many different things. Um, and part of finding your place in it is to find the areas of the tradition that resonate with you. And that could be the spirits, that could be the saints, that could be red letter Bibles. I mean, it could be, it can come, you can come at it from so many different aspects. Mm -hmm. So that's like my mission in yeah. a way is to show people the, the breadth of this tradition in all its forms. Yeah. So you fell away from Catholicism as a youth. And so now you would call yourself Catholic again or? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I would call myself <laughs> a Catholic, you know, like it's, I, I, I mean, I have sat with so many people that are so not this religion that at this point, the labels are almost kind of like funny in a way, but like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would yeah. consider myself Catholic. Yeah. Your answer sounds like, so somebody the other day asked me if I was Christian. I was like, sure. And I gave very similar answers. <laughs> yeah. Like I was like, I was like, I'm not really overly involved in whatever that means. Right. I'm just trying to do like Matthew 25. Like <laughs> I don't want to be like Matthew 23. I'm trying to focus on Matthew 25. I no. don't want to be a brood of vipers. I'm just trying to love my neighbor. Hundred percent. I'm I'm literally in the whatever, same boat. Whatever that is, that's what that's. We'll call myself that. Someone <laughs> called me. Someone said, "Oh, you know, you being a Christian and all, blah blah blah." In a, in a comment online, and I was like, "What? Like, well, it felt so strange." <laughs> you know, I don't really <laughs> think of myself that way. But. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the the titles, uh, evangelical, Catholic, like they all get conscripted to mean mm. whatever they need to mean for um, political power or monetary power or empire power. Yeah. Um, but that's an entirely thing separate of, of spirit. It doesn't um, have to be. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you unpack the Holy spirit and you mm -hmm. unpack it through Pentecost. And, and so you, I, mean, I stopped taking notes cause I felt like I was just literally copying out the book. But like when you unpack it, like you talk about, like, there's like three things and I never really thought about any of these. And I've never really heard it preached either, mm. probably because again, of the denomination that I'm in. So you say, uh, first off, the Holy Spirit arrives, um, which I wrote down. So where the hell is it? Um, B, uh, and then it comes with a glorious noise, which still doesn't make any sense to me. C, and I think you actually call them one, two, three, but whatever. Uh, and then the Spirit wants us to speak. Can you rip those three things apart? Sure. Yeah, I really wanted to emphasize because my understanding of the Holy Spirit as a kid and just in the culture was that it's this kind of like just I don't even etheric thing mm -hmm. you know what I mean like it doesn't really have a place it doesn't really do much it's just kind of like the third part of the Trinity so I went back and I started unpacking well what does it say how is it showing up in these stories and it shows up in three main ways, which are the ways you just mentioned. So the first one is that it arrives, meaning that you feel it. There is a sense that it has, it was not here a moment ago. You felt one way, and then all of a sudden you feel another way. And that's what happens in the Bible. There's, you know, I use the example of Peter placing his hands on some people and the Holy Spirit descending. Now in that story, these people were, believers in Jesus. They were essentially followers of Christ. We're all in, but they still hadn't had, according to the story, they still hadn't had the Holy Spirit or baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is very telling. It tells us that you can say and do and feel all sorts of ways, but the Holy Spirit is something specific that enters your life and you feel it. Does it feel the same for everybody? I'm sure it doesn't. Um, but at least according to the text and to the stories and which are our tradition, these stories, it's something that you feel. It's something that arrives. 
Uh, the second part is the glorious noise. So that's a sort of another an elaboration on that first part, which is that in all these stories, nothing remains the same, right? Like the, the environment that people are in changes. So it's described as a glorious noise, but it's really like things change around you, you know, your experience, at least your experience of things change or changes around you. It's not like you just, it, things are just passive anymore you're, or you're passive to the environment anymore. It's like, no, something is here and it's made itself known. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, and then the third is of course the, um, <clears throat> the push to, to profess or the push to speak. It's another very super common um, theme in, in the arrival of the Holy Spirit is that not only do you have the experience, not only does your environment seem to change, or at least your appreciation of your environment changes, but you are motivated to talk about it, whether it's through prophecy, through tongues, through wisdom, through whatever form you, it takes. Um, so it's this very, it's, it's a very visceral, it's very vibrant. It's a, it's a, it's a big thing. <laughs> it's kind of a big deal, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that's what those three parts are really talking about is that it's something that happens, you feel it and you're changed because of it. So if someone's listening and they're like, I don't think that's ever happened to me. Like I'm sitting back, I'm thinking back through my entire life. I don't know that that ever happened. Mm -hmm what then? Like, is there a feeling of discouragement? Should they be seeking that? How do they possibly sink that? Should they really not worry about it? Like it'll happen when it needs to happen. Like, cause I can, like, as I read through parts of it, I was like, I don't know that I've ever experienced most of these things. And so I was like, well, what is, what does that say about me? Right. You know? Sure. I have felt the same way. I mean, I get it. I, I, you know, my take on that would be that people probably have felt that shift um, in their life and maybe just not attributed it to a, a, a divine of divine origin, so to speak, or, or of some movement or a quickening, what's often called a quickening of the spirit, which I love that, that phrase. Um, but we've all had epiphanies. We've all had aha moments, which are, you know, just kind of like minor, you know, but we've all also had like just deep, rich appreciations of another person or of a situation or of a scenario that's occurring where we just feel above and beyond what we're used to. Mm. Now, are those moments of the Holy Spirit? That's really between you and the Holy Spirit, you know? Mm. But I think if you're tuned to that, and I think the more you, it's a practice, the more you the more you sort of commit to being like, I'm going to just pay attention when those things happen and actually like stay with them a little bit and just feel mm -hmm. what they feel like. I think people will feel that there is something happening here. <clears throat> is it trumpets? Do like trumpets come in and angels? Probably not, but I don't think that's really what it's about. You know, it's a glorious noise. It's a glorious <laughs> noise, but it could be a quiet, <laughs> glorious noise. <laughs> sure. Why not? Don't wake up the neighbors. You know? Um, so does the, what would the concept of the Holy Spirit exist like in the first community that you were writing about in chapter one? Um, like, was that, cause you had said that some of those people that were practicing, um, you know, being basically spiritual mediums for things that have been left unsaid or that need to be said, how does one do that? But then also practice, um, cause you had said some of them were practicing Catholics, I think even in the, in the book. Definitely. So, how does that coincide? Because that just breaks my brain a bit. So the first thing people need to understand is that Catholicism, there's Catholicism of like the Roman Catholic Church, but th that's that's like, um, <laughs> I don't really know how to describe it, but it's kind of like, th that's like the centralized authority on certain matters, right? But it's not the, the end story of what actually goes on in the world, right? This religion is not the church. This religion is, is in flux at all times, is constantly being reinvented, not reinvented like someone invents it. I mean, it's constantly being breathed into new life. Mm -hmm. um, so what that means is that to these people, of course, they're still Catholic. To them, it's like, I grew up Catholic. I believe in Jesus. I go to mass. 
uh, that I perform all the rights, I, I invest myself in it. And I also believe in this other aspect that's doesn't really, the church doesn't really recognize so much, but it's, it's here, you know, it, it's kind of like you participate in the world. And if your world involves spirits, then you participate with spirits. You know what I mean? If your world doesn't involve spirits, you don't, it doesn't mean it's, it infect or it uh, affects yeah. what, what Catholicism is, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to pivot to some of the theology of Paul. I think you, sure. you spend a good section of your time there on the gifts of the spirit, theology of Paul. You got some quotes in there out of Timothy, and I can't remember exactly which Timothy it is. I think that was the part that talks about like demonic spirits, I think, or, or spirits that are not, hold on, I'll actually find it. I have it bookmarked. At least I think I have it. Uh, yeah, Timothy 4.1, the spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. But you break through like a lot of the gifts of the spirit, speaking in tongues, Pentecost, all this stuff throughout Acts and the other books of the Bible. And you rip them apart in ways that I hadn't really prepared to read. Can you talk briefly on some of those? And just to be real honest, speaking in tongues is the one that freaks me out the most. Um, sure. It, matter of fact, my mom asked me the other day and I was like, mom, I don't know. Like literally two days ago. I was like, mom, I really, I don't, I don't know. She asked you what, what are speaking so tongues? Someone, uh, no, she asked me my thoughts about it. Oh. Um, so someone had come to our house. So my, my father recently passed and someone mm. felt like they needed to come and pray with her. And then while they were there praying, there were a couple of them, um, you know, they laid hands on her and then just started praying in a different language. And, um, my mom was like, I didn't know what to do with that. I was like, well, I mean, be great, grateful that they came and, I don't know, mom. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> what do you do with that? Yeah. yeah. So the fruits of the spirits, I think it's because of the, the denomination that I'm in. And again, my upbringing, like I don't, they don't make any sense to me. If that makes, like, they don't hold much logical sense for me. Um, can you go in a bit of what you say a, around those? Because again, sure. they're connected to quote, quote spirit. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, speaking in tongues, you find everywhere around the globe in all traditions, um, this sort of performance. And by, per when I say performance, I don't mean like it's a put on or an act. I mean, like it is, it is an external expression of something that's happening. Um, so, you know, the gifts of the Holy spirit, they're, they're actually spoken of slightly differently in, in a few different areas, but the ones that I speak about, um, are, are very specific in nature. Um, the speaking in tongues, if that's if that's what you're kind of asking about, the speaking in tongues. I'm, I'm curious about all of them. Okay. It just really was recently. Like I literally, yeah. I, think, I was trying to remember what you had said in the book. And I'm like, that's not my answer. My answer is I don't know. <laughs> so. Right, right. So um, Paul says that the Holy Spirit uh, bestows gifts on people who have been in communication with the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit has come down onto them. And he describes them very detailed or, or gives very detailed names of them. One is wisdom. One is knowledge. One is prophecy. One is the ability to heal. One is the ability, the ability to speak in tongues. Whereas another gift is the ability to interpret those tongues. Um, and uh, one is of course, miracles or, or extraordinary act, being able to perform extraordinary acts. Um, and he says, no one will have all of them, right? People will, some people will get this, some people will get that. And the idea is that if we live together, we'll all have, be able to share these gifts with one another and form a nice big, it's like Voltron, you like know, a everyone, church. Like, a church. <laughs> like, a, like a church or like Voltron, <laughs> <laughs> same Voltron. thing, <laughs> um, like the Power Rangers. Same uh, thing. Oh, the Power Rangers are such a cheap knockoff. Of yeah, Voltron. I know. Um, so, uh, <laughs> So, so speaking in tongues, the way I define speaking in tongues and the way I've experienced it is that if you think of the human being as a vessel, right? A vessel that has all of its conditioning, all of its cultural projections, all of its ways of seeing, which are very limited, right? Of course, just by the nature of having eyes in front of their head, our, our, our heads, we are limited in our scope of vision. Um, so we come to all these things with sort of preconceived ideas and, and the things we hold on to. Spirit doesn't abide by that. So a spirit would come down, comes down, and it needs to find a way to express itself. You're kind of like an antenna. And what happens is that message gets very 
garbled in a way, you know what I mean? So people start speaking in languages they don't necessarily know, in languages that nobody knows because they're not languages that we use. Um, they speak in ways that can be quite confusing. So one of the other gifts is the ability to interpret that speech, right? So the speaking in tongues, the way I experience it and, and understand it is that it's kind of watching someone, a human who's this kind of small in a way character in the, in the story, trying to negotiate something that's much bigger, much more sort of like, un, much more feral in a way. Um, and it has to kind of find its way through this very tiny hole we call the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so you're really just witnessing it, you know, so if, so for your mother and she asks like, what, what do you do there? In a way you just kind of witness it, you know what I mean? Make sure the person doesn't get hurt themselves, you know, if they're flailing about, um, but you witness it. And if you believe that these are divine acts, you kind of give thanks that you were able in the presence, you know? Mm. Um, and if there wasn't anyone there to interpret, well, maybe next time, you know? Yeah, because I remember growing up, I was always told if someone's speaking in tongues and there is no one there to interpret, they're not doing it right. And I, but those were the rules I was told. Yeah. So yeah, um, the other ones though. So those ones we don't talk about as much. So prophecy, healing, like all that other stuff. Like, what do we do with those? Um, because I don't know what it's like for someone to use the spirit to speak a prophecy. Like I, again, all of those are well outside of my wheelhouse. So how does one like myself um, know what to listen to? Right. So th that's discernment, you know, that, 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 that's a whole nother practice. You know, the Ignatians are really great at that. Um, are great at talking about like spiritual discernment, being able to discern what's worth listening to and what's not in any scenario, whether it's like what you should buy at the store for groceries or what like is true prophecy or not. Um, but, you know, these things, these gifts are, um, you know, that there's a sense for the person who's experiencing it, that this is not of them, right? That, it's a subtle thing. And we could, as outsiders, we can look and say, well, of course it's you, you're speaking it like what, you know, that's a very, that's a very new, very modern way of understanding what's happening there. Um, it just is according to the history. It's just modern, very new way of thinking that, that it isn't prophecy, you know, a hundred, 200 years ago and all the way back, it would have just been like, yeah, that's prophecy. It just wouldn't have been, it would have been a big deal, but also kind of like not a huge deal. It's like people prophesize. That's what you see it in the Bible all the time. You say, oh yeah. And then he went over there and he was prophesizing for a while. And then he went and like went fishing and it's like, okay, uh, <laughs> the tone, it tells you that this was a much more normative thing. Mm. Um, and we just don't have access to that. I didn't, I wasn't raised with that. You know yeah. what I mean? At all. Yeah. Um, but traveling around, watching other cultures engage in things that were quite similar, you start to see that like, this is, this is everywhere. And this has been around for way longer. This, this way of thinking or appreciating what's happening has been around much longer than, than the way we appreciate it, huh. which is a lack of appreciation. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. Um, what does the role of modern science and specifically like therapy, mental health, how, do, how should that play together with Holy Spirit? Um, because I, I see, and I, I've had people tell me, you know, if something's not happening correctly, I'm just not praying correctly. I'm not in touch with the Holy Spirit, this, that, and the other, like using it as a, as a carrot or a MacGuffin to yield power or um, sway my thoughts on this side or the other. Um, and I've had other people say, well, the whole thing's crazy. Like they just didn't have an understanding of germ theory or anything else. So of course they gave it a name. Like, and that's what they call it. Like, Mm -hmm. That person was just having a psychotic break and they called that a spirit. Um, what, how do those two interplay for today? I, I mean, it, in some sense, it's like, yes. And, you know, it's like, yeah, some of these people were probably epileptic, you mm -hmm. know, um, and they called it spirit. Today we call it epilepsy in a hundred years or 200 years or 500 years or a thousand years. Do you think they're going to call it epilepsy? No. No, they're going to look back and say, well, that was really rudimentary, you know, 
Um, and it isn't, it isn't rudimentary. It's like, we live in a context, like th this idea that things are progressing, like, oh, well, they didn't know this and now they do. And now we know more. It's actually not really true. It's like, you know what you know, given on, we, we base everything we do based on the knowledge we have, mm. right? They didn't know mm. less, they just knew different. You know, it was as true to them as ours is true now. So, yeah. so in some sense, you know, it's a very, um, it, we could say, oh, well, they were just all like, they were, they were having psychotic breaks. Um, sure, maybe they were but the way they interpreted it was, yeah. was different. Um, but what I will say though, there's a really good, I think Ram Dass might've said it, one, one of the major Western spiritual teachers who recently passed away. Um, he, I don't know if it was him. I don't know who said it, but what they said was, somebody said, it. Somebody said this really great thing, which is <laughs> that like, um, you know, mysticism or mystics swim in the ocean that psychotics drown in. Um, so it's this idea that, if you are able to still maintain a connection to the social world, but you have these rich, deep, heavy duty experiences, even if you have them 99% of the time, but 1% you remember, I'm the son of X, Y, and Z, you are still playing in the world of mysticism. If you lose all of that, then in our culture, we call that a psychotic break. That is not how all cultures in India, they don't necessarily call it that, you know, and India is not a rudimentary version of America. It is different. Um, yes. So, so, you know, it's, there's gray area, there's crossover, there's, it's like, there's no line. Certainly once you scratch the surface, there's no line. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly not. I am. Um... I Googled that. If you can believe the Google, that would be Joseph Campbell, which that sounds like something Joseph oh, Campbell would say. Um, that that he makes sense. He said the psychotic drowns in the same waters in which the mystic swims with delight is what uh, this says. Which even is, better. Yeah, sure. Well, it, it's Joseph Campbell. Um, <laughs> yeah. one of my, He's a one pro. Of my, one of my good friends studied under him and, and often he'll say things and I'm like, that's brilliant. He's like, yeah, that was, that was not, that was Joseph Campbell. I'm like, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, at the beginning of your book, and so I want to, so it, for context at recording, for those listening, because honestly, um, uh, honestly, Bob, I have no idea when I'll release this. Um, uh, Soonish, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with a soonish timeline. Um, we just finished with the election. We're like on the Tuesday, whatever day it is. Yeah, the Tuesday after the AP said that, you know, um, Biden became president-elect. So for context for that, uh, that's where we're at in the timeline as, as I'm asking this question, but you write in here that for, and it's in a chapter about orientation, the way that we orient in ourselves towards spirit. You say the U S culture prioritizes self-determination over spirit. What does that mean? Self-determination. And I, and I say that U S culture, it, because it, it's, it feels prescient for the moment that we're in, 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 in the world. Right. So on the whole, despite being a, a, a cons considered to be a very religious society, um, America is North America is considered very religious. Um, on the whole, there's still this idea, and it's it's held to very strongly that at the end of the days, it's a bootstraps culture, right? Like if you want to make something happen, you have to like do it yourself, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's what I'm kind of referring to there. It's not necessarily a culture that sort of says, well, if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. You know what I mean? We may say that that may be part of our lexicon, but the governing principle is that, well, if it's not meant to be and you want it to be, just go do it. Um, yeah. And that's a fine principle. I think that has plenty of pros to it. Um, mm. But it is, uh, but it changes how we understand and how we read a text like the Bible. You know, it, it, it our interpretation of the Bible is colored by that understanding yeah. um, that it's like, oh, well, if you're not, affluent, you know, if you're not rich, you know, you're just not working hard enough. You're, you're not doing enough. You know what I mean? That's, mm -hmm. and if you're not doing enough, it means Jesus is, if they're religious, then they'll say, well, Jesus isn't listening. You're being punished. You know what yeah. I mean? You're not doing enough. Yeah. Um, you know, so it colors. So that's, that's really what I was referring to yeah. there. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I got confused reading that because the way you, so the way you just described it sounds similar to self-determination is equivalent to a prosperity theology. Uh, a, domin a dominionist theology at least that's the way I'm, I'm hearing it um 
so let's pretend um let's pretend humans as a whole are more attuned to listening to spirits in all the manner that that can be manifested specifically the holy spirit what do you feel like changes like what do you see like if people could do that like you know you're like oh yeah this is the outcome of that that's a really good question i don't think i've ever really asked that question (laughs) so what's the outcome so i'm going to just say it back so that I have it. What's the outcome of a society that really appreciates the movement of the spirit? Mm-hmm. Is, that, is that what kind of what you're sure. asking? Yeah. Um, well, it's a lot less determined, mm-hmm. you know, it, the outcomes are a lot less determined. So if there's an appreciation because the spirit doesn't work, you know, if we go according to the stories, the spirit doesn't abide by the rules that we, <laughs> we wish it would all the time. You know, so if there's a true appreciation of the movement of the spirit, then it would mean that we, in theory, we'd be a lot more flexible as far as like what outcomes are, are going to happen or what outcomes might happen so that there'd be room to kind of negotiate those. So if I expect you to be a certain way and yet then I have, then if you are not that way, then it's very difficult for me to engage with you. But if I appreciate the fact that like, there is something else working between us here, then it gives me room. It gives you room to, to live, to be, Hmm. you know, to change your mind, to, you know, turn course. Um, It gives us room to just be bigger, Hmm. to, to have a, a more full range of our human experience. That will be in, a, in an ideal scenario, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> why not? Yeah. Who doesn't yeah. want that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe I'd be able to hear people, and and they'd be able to hear me. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah, I like that. Um, so final, final couple questions. Um, so the last one, you you wrap up the book with some practices. One of which is lectio divina, which is one of my favorite. Mm. ways favorite favorite i don't know if that's a good sentence one of my preferred ways of, of studying scripture i'm mm-hmm. a huge fan i do that and the examine the examine that's i do lovely. every day and lectio divina probably once a week um because it takes a lot more effort it takes a lot of time to, to um, <laughs> like so to i drive it. about 40 minutes each way to work so okay. i can do the examine while i drive without having an accident usually nice. um lectio divina i can't because like i have to close my eyes like it, it takes a lot more concentration than i'm driving a four thousand pound piece of steel like I, <laughs> I need to be at least marginally focused so of those practices, which ones do you feel like are maybe a few that people that are un, that are uncomfortable or, or maybe have never thought about trying to attune themselves to the spirit that they could begin to engage in in a way that would kind of slowly wade into the waters, if that makes any sense? A hundred, yeah, hundred percent, it makes sense. I mean, the daily examine is 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 a beautiful way to do that. Um, you know, those practices I give in there, and, and I give a preface to it. Um, are not meant to, they're not like ways to listen to the spirit. You know, what they are, are they're ways to slow down and become sensitive to your environment, whether that be the environment of the holy books, your environment of like literally sounds around you, because we don't do that. That's Mm -hmm. many of us. Um, We just don't make time for that. And what I found in when I first started engaging with this more like spirit, I call it a spiritful, so rather than spiritual, spiritful practices is mm. it took me a while because I actually had to shut up, you know, <laughs> like just be, you know, which is not to say like I would, I was doing lots of other things, like yoga and stuff, but like, so I had an understanding of what that meant even, but some people have no idea what that even means. Yeah. Like say, what do you mean? be quiet, like be quiet and do what? So the practices I give in there are kind of very beginner, not beginner, they can, you can do them the rest of your life, but they're easily approachable practices to start, to start listening. Um, but what you were talking about, the daily examine or um, Lectio Divina, you know, reading spiritual texts in a, in a very contemplative manner. I mean, that's, that's where the goods are, you know, those are great mm-hmm. ones. The Ignatians, I mentioned them before, you know, they know how to do that they're good people to go talk to, or at least read from, you know, yeah. um, there's, they're versed in yeah. that kind of stuff. Which ones do you do? Which ones are your fallback on? So you, like, if you've had a stressful day or a stressful month or whatever, like what, what are the ones that you fall back on where you're like, all right, I really need to get refocused here. So 
my practice basically at this point is doing, um, right now I'm doing the Ignatian spiritual exercises, mm -hmm. which I've been doing for every day for, for half a year now. Um, so that's, uh, uh, reading aspects of the scripture, the teachings of Ignatius, St. Ignatius. Um, and it's kind of like elected divinity, elected divinity in some ways, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. that contemplative reading. Um, but every morning, you know, I, I get up very early and I, I, make a little, um, say some prayers. I have an altar and I say my prayers there and I do some chanting and some singing and then I practice yoga and then, you know, it just starts very early. And then I, I clean my apartment for an hour, <laughs> which is another practice I do, yeah. you know? So I have, I chant while I practice, while I clean for an hour, typically not every day, but most days. So I do a lot. There's lots that I do. Yeah. Um, but if, if to answer your question, if I'm just like, man, I'm feeling really like I might say a rosary or, you know, sing some hymns and things like that. I, I, I'm a big, like what are called like bhakti. Bhakti is the, the yogic tradition of like devotion. I okay. like to sing, you know what I mean? I like to sing old folk songs and, and hymns huh. and stuff. Those really kind of like, just shake it out, you know? Yeah. Yoga is also on the list of things I am entirely ignorant of. Um, oh, that's okay. Never have, never have done any yoga mm -hmm. outside of, watching my wife do it like as a as a form of exercise um sure not, not that works a, not a spiritual thing at all um so a question i've been asking everyone this year uh and so i'd like to end with this and then um yeah uh so if you were trying to wrap words around you know here's what god is the divine is whatever and you're trying to explain that to someone say the person that lives below or above you like what do you say to that I say that God fills all the cracks. You know what I mean? God is where God is the incomprehensible, um, just motivating force for all things and all non things. That's a very big answer. Mm -hmm. But I would also say that God refines itself for us to experience God through saints or, or, special beings or, um, or prayers or songs or trees, you know, or just in life itself, like we can experience God in all sorts of fashions around us because God is in all those things. So while we can't comprehend the scope of God, we don't need to because we've got the tree and we've got the saints and we've got the songs, you know? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. God yeah. did us a, a real solid there. <laughs> <laughs> making it a little easy <laughs> i love it bob where do you want people to go where, where do they go to do the things do the things with me yeah so yeah. i spend most of my time unfortunately on instagram mm. uh so i have a instagram handle known as new old traditions um that's where i spend a lot of time i post videos there talks there mm. quips there um I do, uh, I don't, I stream there. I host classes. Um, anything I'm doing, I post there. Huh. Um, yeah, I just use it as kind of my website at this point. New old traditions. New old traditions. I love that. It's oxymoronic. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. I appreciate your time so much tonight. Thanks and so much, um, Seth. Yeah. Thanks for allowing me to fumble through. Some really I think you did great. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually do have another question. It's, yeah, it sure. won't be in the episode. Um, so you say at the beginning, and, and I didn't want to ask it in the episode because I'm not, you know, answer it in the book. At least I can't see that you do. So at the very beginning, you talk about a spirit saying, they ask you if you're gay. Uh -huh. like, I expected you to resolve that. Um, but you're I not the first. Think, yeah. So where are you at with that? And that may be a very inappropriate question, but like I needed, res I needed resolve. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, he I can tell you why. I mean, I, I gave him the, the correct an the answer that I believe, you know, I, yeah, I don't yeah. identify as homosexual or anything. Yeah. Um, but the, the reason is because in that tradition, um, it's a very open tradition, meaning like people that would not necessarily be allowed to participate in church affairs mm -hmm. can participate in there. So like homosexuals and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but so, but, but, there are certain things that homosexuals can't do. And there's certain things that only homosexuals can do. Um, so in that tradition, the, in that uh, tradition, Lukumi, okay. it's mm -hmm. Santeria. Mm -hmm. 
okay. which you've probably heard that term. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, but that's the same thing. It's the same thing. It, it they say Lakumi because that's the that's the actual name of it. Santeria is kind of like the the term that like the the Westerners just kind of gave mm. it to them. Mm. Um, so they uh, they were as far as I understand it, they were they were having spirit experiences and were and thought okay we actually have to ask him if he's gay or not because if the spirits are telling us that he might take go down this path because there's many paths in that religion like you can go down this path and end up here you can go down this path and end up here meaning like you can end up being a priest or you can end up being a, an officiant or you know there's different like trajectories mm -hmm. um they wanted to know that kind of early on so that's where that question came from as far yeah. as i understand yeah. Is that a common question they'd ask like everyone? Yeah, probably, huh. you know, um, yeah, it's, they, it's a, it's Latin American culture. So there's a lot less rules around yeah. like, what's okay to like, we would never ask that question, well, but like when, when you're in India, well, they'll ask you what you make. It, when I read it, I was like, so what happened the 18 hours before you end up in this room? Cause I was like, I don't, what happened before that, that someone gets to ask that question. Like, as I was reading, I was like, that doesn't, is either it's just so foreign to me um just yeah. out, out front ask that question but yeah um it's yeah. cultural you know like yeah. no one cared everyone was like yeah well, maybe like yeah. look around um yeah. you one other question i'll let yeah, you sure get. no that's fine use the word marianite tradition or Ma marian traditions or something mm -hmm. like that is that the same thing as marianite catholics no so marian just means like um Catholics who have a particular devotion or affinity to, to Mary. Mm -hmm. So Mariolo Marianology or Mariology, actually, um, you know, the study of Mary and, and that whole part of the biblical, you know, narrative. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, people who have a particular affinity to Mary. Vatican I would have been that pre it, okay. John Pope Paul. Okay. So yeah. that that's, so that's entirely separate then from Mary and I Catholic. Okay. Yeah. They, 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 the terms have some relationship, but Marian yeah. is more broad. It just means okay. like okay. the Marian aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I do one of these, I have so much more stuff to learn. So yeah, so, I mean, that's cool. Yeah, I guess it's good. Um, yeah. Also, I'm going to use, uh, I, I, I was going to do um, the title of your book this episode, but I think I'm just going to say the gifts of the spirit are like Voltron. That's just going to be the episode title. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that this, works. Why not? Um, well, good. Um, yeah, I appreciate it very much. So how do I make that turn off? There we go. Um, apologize again for being late. And um, I'll shoot you an email when it goes live. Um, and I'll, oh, I should have stopped that.